Well, the greatest generation fought for some significant gains in this country. In fact, we we're the greatest nation on earth moving forward. A lot of those gains that we experienced from that sacrifice were on the edge of losing. And I want to talk, this is a positive speech, but I want to just give you a hint of where we're at right now. We talked about a lot of this in 2010. It's back here in spades now, four years later. We already heard about the debt. I mean, that was a wonderful you know, picture, a word picture, about the, the bills stacked together. I mean, it's an unimaginable number, 17 trillion, 200 trillion future unfunded liabilities. I mean, it's an impossible number to pay back, right? We know that we're headed for catastrophe at some point in the future, but it's not just that. We've got Obamacare, right? Yeah. And it's hitting us not just in you know, the sense of losing free exercise rights, if you're you know, a small businessman or woman that doesn't want to do certain things in violation of conscience, but it's hurting the very foundation of the healthcare system. It's hurting doctors, doctor shortages, obviously, death panels, they're a reality. These are all things that are coming true if we don't stop this. 20% of our economy, by some calculations. We have an entitlement state, and we also have a problem now that's created by demographics. Every day, 10,000 baby boomers retire. It's untenable. You've got a social security system, you've got a Medicare system that's going upside down that's adding even more to those future unfunded liabilities. And yet, in Washington, D.C., everybody just keeps spending and spending and controlling and controlling and more. And we must stop it. One of the things that we predicted back in 2010 was the downgrade of our debt. That's happened several times. We're now paying more for interest on our debt, almost double, I think, from a year ago. Uh, of course, that has an impact on deficit. We talked about federal spending in this state. I told you it doesn't matter whether you elect me or not. Earmarks are going to be gone. Federal spending is going to go down in the state. Uh, Fairbanks, for example, is already faced with that, where we used to have hundreds of millions in federal uh, Corps of Engineer contracts, down to tens of millions. We have people all over our borough that are leaving, going down south to the Dakotas to work. Some of them are going elsewhere, contractors pulling up stakes. And yet we are in the richest resource-based state in the nation. We are an economic, or could be an economic breadbasket of the world if we're allowed to do it. But these pressures are all moving us towards a tipping point. Now, this country has faced challenges before. And I want to tell you a little bit about me, not to pump me up, because that's not what this is about, but I want to give you kind of a, an idea of where I come from, because you know, in part, a lot of you probably didn't hear that in the last election. But I want to give you a sense for where I'm at, why I fight tenaciously. It's because of how I grew up. I grew up in the Midwest, uh, the yeah. grandson of a rancher and a grandson of a farmer. My dad was an independent Christian minister, as that uh, video pointed out. You know, we don't live with very many means. We're, we considered a poor family. And so for in order for us to get by, in order for the kids to get by, uh, my mom, for example, how many people remember Tough Skins from Sears? <laughs> you know why you bought Tough Skins when you were a kid? Because you wore out the knee, Sears would give you a new pair. Right. And when they stopped doing that, mom and dad would patch them. Yeah. And so that was kind of the story. And I knew that in order to do anything that I wanted to do, I had to make money. So I had a first-hand seat, basically, in the free enterprise system. My dad at the bookstore, he had a bookstore, and he was able to provide me with a part-time job. I'd probably be in violation of my kids if they were to do that today. It would probably be in violation of child labor laws. <laughs> but my dad had me stamp, literally, a thousand brochures for a dollar. So I'd have to use this little impression, you know, Christian Books and Gifts, or whatever it was with the address on it, and I'd get a penny for every 10 that I stamped. And that's how I earned money. I mowed lawns. That's how I got by. There were some other issues that faced me when I was a kid. Uh, in first grade, I used to, I don't know how many people remember this and with a mic in my hand, I can't really show you, but remember those aisles in school? You'd lift yourself up on the desk and kind of swing along. That was a no-go. And I did not follow my teacher's instruction. He was such a compliant child. I was not a very compliant child. Just ask my mom. <laughs> so anyway, I slipped and fell face down. This is first grade. And hit my face flat out on the floor. We didn't have health care, so of course I had to go to the doctor and uh, had some scar tissue build up in my lip. It really was a pretty big lip, actually. And it had an impact on me because, you know, kids aren't always nice. There's some bullying that goes on every once in a while. And I decided at that point, rather than just uh, stew in my tears, I thought, you know, I'm going to work to fix this thing. So I started to save those dollars from stamping the brochures, started to save the dollars from mowing the lawns, and I got a bus ticket. I went down to Wichita, Kansas, got an appointment, found a doctor, paid, I think at the time, two or $300, 
and cut the scar tissue off, and that was seventh grade. Went through six years of that, but was able to do it. And the reason why is because I knew that there was a better tomorrow. I mean, I, I was raised in understanding from my dad and mom that, look, tomorrow's a better day. You have wonderful opportunity. I mean, look at this nation. The first nation to walk on the moon, right? I mean, we moved into the Reagan era. That's when I went to West Point, and Pride was incredible at the time. You had the B-1 bomber, well, B-2 bomber, too. You had the stealth fighter, right? All those things were unveiled. Just an extraordinary time to be alive, and we had pride in our country. It was one of those things that motivated you forward. You knew that tomorrow was going to bring more. And it's the same thing today that can motivate each one of us. You know, I could talk more about things. We had, you know, my comrade in arms, uh, we had in, in Denver Storm, a mirac really miraculous outcome. We got in, got out. Uh, you know, there were 200 plus casualties. Uh, that, frankly, I mean, it was just an extraordinary event. We had hundreds of thousands of troops on the ground. My unit was a breaching unit uh, in 234 armor. The, we were in the 1st Infantry Division. We did that right hook around through the neutral zone. And our unit was one of the first units to go through the breaching area where there were a lot of mines. Those of you who remember that 91 conflict probably recall that there was an ex expectation we we're going to lose a lot of guys. It came down through our chain of command that we were going to lose at least two-thirds or more of my unit because we're a breaching force. And yet we didn't accept that. We knew that not only did we have, we, we knew, we believed in the power of prayer. That was number one. But number two, we also we were not going to allow the negative to get us down. We knew it was something that we could accomplish. We can even talk a little bit about our experience here in Alaska. We're in our 20th year here. Uh, but uh, getting up here was a little bit of a struggle. And once we got here, having a large family, is a little bit of a struggle finding a house with a normal size to live in for the number of children we had. And I'm sure that many of you can identify with this. We found a house that had to do an Alaska addition or two. And we did the same thing. We're from the ground up. Yep. And Toe, and, and, and I submitted my wife to six months with a, an outhouse, I think it was. Wow. Something like that. Yeah. But we needed a place to live. We bought a, a log mill. We did it. And she's still married to me today, 22 years. Wow. Now that's tenaciousness. Maybe I should write a She should write a book. But I'm going to let her publish it. So, you know, but I've been honored to, to live a version of the American dream. You know, I mean, a dirt poor Kansas kid, being able to go from, you know, where we were at then to now. And of course, we're under adversary, it's kind of an adversarial relationship with politics, but I'm just talking about outside of that. I mean, we've been extraordinarily blessed. And it was opportunity that was provided to us by the greatest nation on earth. Now, you know, what we've got right now is a situation, like I said before, we're during this tipping point. Things are starting to slip away. And I am convinced that the type of opportunity that I had as a kid, although the wealthy and the blue villages, they may have it okay. Those that are at the bottom of the rungs, the middle class, the middle class has taken it worse than we've seen in decades. Now, the middle class right now, medium net worth is low. We've seen a stagnation of wages. We already see kind of the birth pangs of what's happening to our economy at the middle class. It's something that we cannot, if we don't turn it around, this nation is going to be in a position that it's not going to be able to recover from. Yeah. And, and that's not the only thing. I mean, freedom itself in this country is under threat. Uh, freedom of conscience, we talked about that just a minute ago. We see with Obamacare, basically, businesses being forced to do things they don't want to do. Hobby Lobby is a good example of that. A business that's under fire, but a business is fighting back. And they need our prayers and support. We have government that's founded on big government crony capitalism. A government that decides it's going to pick the winners and the losers. The old time free enterprise system where you pulled yourself up by the bootstraps, where you worked hard and you were rewarded based upon that work, where you had competition, that's no longer the way the game is played at the top. Instead, they set things in motion so that some with a, with, with a lot may actually end up with a lot more because they rigged the game. And that is something that is so unlike the American way that gave us that opportunity that I lived with as a child and grew up into as a young adult. So we've got all these symptoms of the disease, right? We've got all these symptoms. But we've got to treat the source of those symptoms. The psalmist rightly asked, if the foundations be destroyed, what can the just do? There is only one way to save this country, and that's to return to first principles. Now, our founders also said something else. They knew that, for example, only God gives rights. I mean, the government, you know, it gives you something, it can take it away. It tries to create dependency. But the core issue is the government gives you something, it has the right to take it away. Our founders recognized 
that the only way that you can secure your rights is to acknowledge those rights given by God. Because those are unalienable rights. And that's what the founder said, right? We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among those are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Well, let's talk about life first. It's the highest order priority. That's why the first thing I'm gonna do, one of the first things I'm gonna do when I get into the Senate is to join with Rand Paul on the Life Conception Bill. Amen. Let's hear some claps. I mean, fine, if we don't defend the most defenseless, what, what are we as a nation? And it is constitutional. No deprivation of life without the due process of law. It's the way forward. How about liberty? Well, we yeah. talked about that already. Liberty is completely under threat right now. We've seen it with Obamacare. We see it in other ways, too. We see coercion in the marketplace, right? If government tells you you got to buy something that you don't want, that's a form of coercion, right? Yeah. I don't care what you call it, a tax or whatnot. It is coercion in the marketplace. That's not what liberty is about. We have federal coercion of private conscience, where people of, of strong religious foundation they decide that they don't want to do something in their business, and yet government says you've got to do it. What do we know about the First Amendment? Congress shall make no law prohibiting free exercise. Right? No law. And yet Congress goes ahead and does it, or the president does, you know, because he says he's going to act, whether Congress says it or not. And let me tell you what, I mean, that's the type of thing that everybody ought to be crying out for impeachment over. I know that's not a popular target in mainstream media, but the fact that it is, if you've got a president that repeatedly says at the State of the Union and elsewhere that if you don't act legislative body, I'm going to act, that's an impeachable offense. So where else is liberty under fire? We got the federal surveillance state, right? Oh, we got to make things secure because, you know, what about international terrorism? What about the border? What about securing the border? Don't you think that's the first line of defense? It's all hogwash. It's about controlling you. It's about granting government more power. And it's moving government toward tyranny. We have to fight it. You know, a poll just came out that shows that 37% of Americans, I think it is, view the federal government as the most significant threat. But that's a wake-up call. It ought to be a wake-up call to those in federal office, for those in D.C., who think they can continue to expand government power, continue to violate conscience, the free exercise, the Fourth Amendment, the free exercise of the First Amendment, the Fourth Amendment. They need to understand that the people have had it. They've had it. That's why you're here today. This is about we the people. It's not about Joe Miller. It's about restoring you to your rightful position, where government is the servant and you are the master. So happiness, that's a zero. When we talk about happiness, pursuit of happiness, we know that when government infringes, when they take control, when they create dependency and ask for more out of us, what happens? What happens to our ability to act? It's restricted, right? Our ability to pursue happiness is limited. Whenever government does something, freedom is impacted because it's a zero-sum game. You give power to government, you take it away from the individual and the state. And the time is now to stop the infringement and roll back the federal controls, and you can help us do it. So I think all of us, I think the only thing that we want to do is be permitted to live our lives free of federal interference. I, you know, I characterize myself as a federal libertarian. I think the federal government needs to get out of all of these areas that it's in so that we can pursue those dreams. In Alaska, that's an exceptional opportunity. You know, when we see what happened in Nevada, you know, last week, week and a half ago, major bad, right? But you know what? There's some good out of all of this because the nation is being alerted an over-intrusive federal government that has no business in land ownership. Yeah. 
especially in the western states. Now, I'm happy to allow the federal government to have the military bases. Alaska is very geostrategically important. We have a centerpiece in the strategy and the security of our nation. There's no question about it. But when I talk about land ownership, I'm talking about the hundreds of thousands of acres, the fact that the majority of the land in this state is under federal title, the fact that in Nevada, where that happened with the BLM, it's almost 90, over 90% of the state. And, and other states in that same area. I mean, it's extraordinary, the level of federal ownership, and where's the enumerated power that allows it? The exciting thing is people are alerted to that. Remember the shutdown that happened, where you know Obama blamed the House of Representatives for it, and yeah. everybody scurried away and didn't do anything? Yeah. There's a bright side to that, too, because everybody saw Obama shutting down access to federal lands, yeah. knew it was just political retaliation, right. and started scratching their head and asking, why are the feds in charge of this? So when you buy into the We the People movement, where we're trying to restore your leadership to the federal government, keep in mind that that includes an incredible opportunity for Alaska. We're trying to join with the likes of Mike Lee, Ted Cruz, Rand Paul, that are doing everything they can to push back this federal ownership. Yeah. And it can't happen. <laughs> we live in trying times, but with trying times, there's great opportunity. Yeah, we know the insolvency thing, it's not going away. We're going to have to confront it. Either hyperinflation or default, something's going to happen in the near future. We have opportunity for more freedom at that point, or we can move toward government control. I'm opting for freedom. That's why I'm in this race. But I've had enough with gangster government. I've had enough with the surveillance state. I've had enough with a tyrannical IRS that thinks it can use its agency to do anything it wants to the likes of us. Yeah. I'm, up, I'm up to my eyeballs with the EPA. All you have to say is the words chicken Alaska and you know where I stand on that issue. <laughs> enough with the lobbyists, the governmental establishment people that want to move the state or that move the federal government even greater into our lives. Enough with everybody that's trying to take control of the destiny of the state. It is my view that we have to return the power to the people. Again, it's not about Joe Miller. It's about making sure that your interests are represented in Washington, D.C. So join with me to help repeal Obamacare. Let's repeal the surveillance state. Let's abolish the IRS. For the sakes of our children and my grandchildren, your grandchildren, let's end the intergenerational theft. And let's put spending limits on Congress so that they can actually live within their means. And finally, let's return power to the states so that Alaska can live up to its true potential. Yeah. Never forget, you know, I came up here to Alaska, Kathleen and I did. It was our dream, but it was also our call. This state is at the front lines. This election is at the front lines. I don't know how much opportunity we have left, but this is about you and making sure that we take this country back. Please join with me. Thank you for coming, and God bless Alaska.